Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Can I Say Something podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with one of my favorite film critics working today. She's a project manager and a freelance writer at the New York Times. You can also find her work at theplaylist.com and on TikTok at Neil's mom. Lena Wilson, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you so much. That was such a, a very sweet introduction. I'm like, you know, blushing in my kitchen. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I feel like the TikTok algorithm, you know, is scarily a- a- accurate. It is scary at times how accurate it can be. But I feel like it's it's yeah. one of the benefits of it is me finding your work on there. So that's a plus, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, I honestly, before I got TikTok, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk all about what that's like, because I know there aren't a lot of film critics uh, doing what I do over there. But um, before I got TikTok, I honestly didn't know that I had an audience for what I wanted to do, you know, like writing particularly about genre films and, uh, you know, like marginalized people and women in film. I was like, this is just something that people let me do sometimes and then like thousands of people were like i'm specifically interested in you doing that and i was like yeah. oh cool <laughs> so yeah that was gonna be my first question did you expect at all the sort of success you found on there on tiktok oh yeah no not at all i mean it is like deeply jarring for me to have a internet following of any kind um for so many reasons <laughs> i mean i was like wildly unpopular in high school so like i'm still just not over that um but i also you know have never really taken to any social media platform um too strongly you know like i've i was on facebook and uh i am on instagram but um to suddenly like be doing really well at social media it has never <laughs> was never something I, I really foresaw for myself yeah yeah that's interesting so you know when, what was your sort of upbringing? Did you go into horror movies early? Did, was that a sort of thing that you were introduced by your parents? How, how did you sort of come across that genre? Oh, man. Uh, no, I'm like a big scaredy cat. Um, I, <laughs> I I like to say, not to brag, but I have a lot of anxiety. Mm. Um, <laughs> and so as a kid, I was like, I cannot do this. Absolutely not. Um, and then I think the first horror movie I ever saw was The Haunting in Connecticut, um, which was some, you know, horrifyingly terrible, um, like, wide release in, I want to say, like, 08 or 07. Um, So I was 13 or 14, and um, I, like, survived it. (laughs) And I was like, (laughs) okay, I guess I can do this. And I became just kind of, like, really interested in horror as like a vehicle for, you know, like cultural anxiety. And, and I just became interested with like sort of the adrenaline rush aspect of, of watching horror movies, right? And so like me and two of my friends in middle school would have like horror movie Fridays and rent like terrible horror movies from Blockbuster <laughs> and watch them. Yeah. Um, but I didn't really become interested in, it in what I would call like a serious or particularly analytical way until um college when i was getting my film studies degree uh in large part because um one of the smartest women i've ever met in my life um who was also doing the film studies program with me uh introduced me to the book men women and chainsaws by uh, carol clover oh, yeah. um and uh you know i read all kinds of scholarship just in like feminist film studies classes and queer film studies classes about, you know, the transgressive nature of horror. And I was like, there is actually so much here uh, that nobody wants to talk about. And so, yeah, I just, I, I find it to be, um, it's my favorite genre. I tell people because I I find it to be the genre where there is the most potential for anything to happen, (laughs) both in terms of form and content. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Completely agree. Um, with all that, um, you went to Smith College. I'm a uh, resident in the Berkshires, so I've, 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 you know, been through Northampton quite a few times. One of my, one of my favorite places to to visit. Um, how did you like Northampton? Did you like the restaurants? Did you like the music scene and all that? Oh no way! Yeah, I, uh, I actually lived in East Hampton for two years after I graduated school. Um, it's also very funny for me to like be in a position where a bunch of teenagers on TikTok are like asking me for professional advice because <laughs> <laughs> I got like fired from my first job out of college um, oh, really? and was have basically just, you know, 
stumbled into this this cool situation where I'm freelancing for some some respectable outlets. But um, yeah, I, I bummed around uh, Pioneer Valley for a couple of years, and I actually worked at Amherst Cinema, um, which oh, nice. was how I got my my yayas film wise for <laughs> for a while. Nice. So you. When you were approaching like these outlets of, you know, New York Times and, and Slate and p- things like that, did you, did you sort of say like, this is my wheelhouse. I like this sort of genre stuff. And then they were like, okay, you can, you can be that person, you know, is that, is it basically how, how that, um, that thing worked? You know, that's really interesting. Um, I am honestly not sure how I pitched myself to the playlist. I, the first thing I ever wrote for yeah. them, um, was a feature about how like men should calm down about there being a female doctor on Doctor Who. Um, oh, really? so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think, uh, the editor, uh, of the playlist, Rodrigo Perez, um, like, you know, saw, a need for kind of a mouthy lady. Um, <laughs> and I <laughs> am always more than ready to, to fill that need. Um, and, you know, I, I did some other features about like the feminist history of Jane Campion for them. And I did uh, a feature that I still think about a lot, honestly, when Me Too was coming out about the history of rape scenes in cinema. Um, so, you know, I think like, obviously writing about film through particularly a gender lens is a strength of mine that editors have, uh, you know, sought out and nurtured in, in certain ways. Um, I've also had editors where I really had to fight against, you know, feeling like I was kind of being pigeonholed or, or tokenized. Um, and also editors where I, I felt like I had to fight to be like, no, actually, like, <laughs> misogyny is important, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, it, right. it, it's kind of run the gamut. Um, but, you know, the outlets I write for now, I think, uh, have been really supportive about sort of helping me find my voice and, and fit that range. I mean, mm. I don't, I haven't found my voice at, at the New York Times. <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> I think I, I was pretty solid by the time I got there, but, um, yeah. I mean, you know, I wrote my first review for them. I pitched that review actually on Violation, um, which is a mm. harrowing rape revenge film on Shudder. <laughs> uh, mm. Yes. And um, I have written on everything from shark documentaries to Hor- horrible paranormal teen romance sense. So it's been <laughs> yeah. a really great yeah. learning experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I checked out Violation on your recommendation. Very uncomfortable movie. Very, you know, for to be a, a man watching that movie, it's very, very uncomfortable. And I'm wondering from, in your opinion, is that uncomfortableness that I felt sort of the point of it to, to sort of, you know, t- um, twist to the expectations of what you're watching you know are they saying like this is what women have felt for for decades now you now you you should feel is that sort of the underlying uh, motivation for that movie yeah that's interesting i guess it kind of depends when you felt uncomfortable right i think that movie hmm. like i i mean i i don't know that there was a time i felt comfortable <laughs> during that movie right, ever so right. maybe that's not a fair question but <laughs> like i do think that there are subtle ways in which sims fewer and Minson, uh, mancinelli the directors um subvert genre expectations uh that like you know aren't aren't necessarily totally explicit like there's no female nudity in the film whatsoever or no like sexualized female nudity but there is like full frontal male nudity particularly in like a uh, situation where a man is about to be bodily harmed (laughs) um right right and so you know i think like things like that uh definitely are just disorienting like and and, you know I, i say that as a female viewer just because of all of the genre conventions i have become intimately familiar with Um, and I think also like the rape narrative in that film is not cut and dry, right? Like in, um, I, I spit on your grave or miss 45, like you have these horrifying sociopathic men, like coming out of the bushes and like holding these women down. Um, but violation is about like a man that the protagonist trusted and even flirted with, um, 
taking advantage of her and, and then saying that, you know, he, that's not how he understood the situation. And so it's like, there's so much, uh, ambiguity that I think that genre, like, has resisted for so long um, that I think yeah. makes it such a productive addition. It's really incredible movie. I think everyone should check, should check that out. Um, do you ever get like viscerally affected by the things you see? I always talk to my friends about all these movies I see and they're like, how do you, how do you sleep at night? How do you, <laughs> how are you mentally? Okay. Um, <laughs> I just watched Titan last year and you know, the, the, the scene where she's breaking her nose in the bathroom with some, some of those viscerally like violent things I've seen on screen in a long time. Do you mm-hmm. ever just like, Oh, look away. And you're just like, Oh my God, I can't, <laughs> I literally can't watch this, this scene right here. Yeah, no, I mean, Du No is definitely like my kryptonite a little bit. I'm not really a, a body horror kind of guy so i i i I get the shakes from her um for sure but uh i mean in general like my my joke is you know i don't worry about uh the stuff i watch on tv i I worry about like you know intimacy and like stuff that, that normal people shouldn't be worried about um so yeah for whatever reason it just doesn't really sit with me or or if it does it's um, almost in a cathartic way, like Hereditary is probably one of the films that has like emotionally disturbed me the most in my entire life. Um, but for me, like that wasn't because I think it's disturbing to see Tony Collette, uh, saw her own head off. Um, <laughs> it's because like, I feel like my favorite interpretation of that film is that it's basically like, what if because a family wouldn't talk about something, everybody died? <laughs> and so that's like right, right. <laughs> based in, you know, so, some real like human fears around like difficult emotions and, and vulnerability and stuff yeah. and, and stuff that hits pretty close to home for me. So, you know, I find that uh, in a very cathartic way, horror just like gives me a lot of the emotional language I might not come upon organically myself. So... Right, right, absolutely. Was there that scene in Hereditary? Let me ask you, because that that scene where she's twenty clocks up in the corner. Yeah. The the filmmaker, I'm forgetting um, his name, but he did a thing where he put her up in the corner, and the room was completely dark, and he allowed the viewer to sort of work for the viewing of her because there's so many horror movies will either put a light on it or spotlight on it or some light, light the room in a way where you don't have to do a lot of work to actually see the creature, mm-hmm. see the person in there. Am I wrong in thinking that that was sort of a one of the first times that we've ever seen like a scene in which was lit and and shot in a way where it sort of challenged the viewer to be like, hey, pay attention to this whole screen and and look for what I'm trying to show you? No, totally. I mean, I like, you know, I I joke about being uh, this champion for for female filmmakers, but like Ari Aster and Jordan Peele are both like, welcome to my dinner party anytime, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I love Ari Aster very, very much. Um, I think that yeah. he's a genius. And I think, you know, yeah, Hereditary is a, both a masterwork and a first feature, which is so crazy. Yes. Um, yes. And yeah, I, I, I just, I totally agree. I think that um, yeah. it's a film that deals like so much with the subconscious and with like experiencing disturbances like both as observers of these characters but also almost as these characters in a way that i i find very disquieting um i just think he he strikes a really excellent balance yeah absolutely um so i want to uh pull back a little bit and just talk about um how you how we watch movies in general because obviously in the pandemic we're watching movies at home on our phones on on laptops things like that for you is, is it harder to watch things at home do you feel like your your reception of movies has changed over the last two years as you're watching things on a tv or at home versus watching them in a theater or at a festival Yeah, I mean, you know, I try to just grant myself some grace these days. I think earlier in the pandemic, I I had a lot of guilt about not being 100% focused on my TV at all times when I I had to review something or uh, was watching it for professional reasons, or even for non professional reasons. (laughs) Um, Because I do, (laughs) you know, it's such a particular art form. And I, I am like, as much as I'm not with Martin Scorsese on a lot of things, I'm with Martin Scorsese on like the, you know, the preservation of cinema. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. 
And, you know, I, I tell anyone and everyone, like, the number one way I would love for people to see any given movie is at pre- preferably an independent movie theater. But for so many reasons, that's mm. not possible, particularly in the pandemic. Um, and also, as a critic, like reviewing a lot of indie films, um, you know, these small distributors uh, can't rent out an entire theater in the Times Square AMC <laughs> the way that like, you know, Universal yeah. or Lionsgate can. So that's also just part right. of the experience of branching out uh, film wise for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I take notes to stay focused on the film um, and mm-hmm. try to, you know, have my phone on the other side of the room, uh, as many lights yeah. off as possible. Um, but yeah, you know, I've definitely paused a, a boring <laughs> movie I had to review <laughs> more than a couple times in the yeah. last two years. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, do you do you ever find yourself like going back to a movie and do you feel like you're um, do you ever find yourself wishing you could like redo a review because you, you're, you're feeling so drastically changed on a second or third viewing? Mm, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, uh, you know, the first interpretation is the first interpretation. I mm. try very hard not to read anybody else's criticism before I write my own because, um, you know, it, it, it's my opinion and not anybody else's. Um, but I have the experience, have had the experience, um, a handful of times where I read some criticism of a work before I was criticizing it and I had such a wildly different, <laughs> like, take, uh, or experience yeah. Yeah. that I'm like, oh, am I, did I do it wrong? Which is funny because, you know, I feel like one of my biggest uh, grievances as a TikTok critic is that people often come away from my, uh, you know, my little video reviews, uh, either thinking that I have a a right or a wrong opinion. And that is antithetical to the nature of opinion. (laughs) Um, So, you know, as long as I have an experience and can, back it up with evidence from the film. It's my experience to write about. Um, But I actually, I had that with a film I reviewed for the New York Times um, just this week. That review came out uh, on February 17th. And um, the ending is like incredibly confusing. I think purposefully so. Um, But I had seen like a critic I respect uh, come away with like a very definitive interpretation. Um, And I was like, oh, man. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, to at a certain point, you just kind of have to get good with yourself and realize like, it's your one shot. Uh, Maybe you'll feel differently in a month or a couple of years. Um, Who's to say, like, you know, I thought Garden State was the most profound movie anybody had ever made in 2007. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, I think for the most part, yeah, yeah, for the most part, like I I honor what I wrote in that moment, um, whether my feelings have changed about, you know, the cultural context I'm writing in or, or whatever, I think the experience of the film is pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, great. Uh, you know, really well said. Um, what do you think about the sort of, uh, you know, cycle we're in now with horror movies where, you know, elevated horror has sort of been, you know, they're, they're taking it out at the knees with Scream. The new, I haven't seen the new Scream, but I understand it sort of, you know, criticizes that genre now. Is that sort of, are we at the, uh, end point of the elevated horror cycle? And if we are, you know, what's coming next, do you think? Yeah, that's so interesting. I feel like, cultural appetite has such an insanely short lifespan now and it's scary to think of it like only getting shorter i'm like get out was just nominated for an oscar like yesterday you know (laughs) like like the the idea of a horror movie being nominated for an oscar is still like so amazing to me um and obviously i you know don't live and die by the oscars for a million reasons but there's cultural cachet there and um I just love that people take horror seriously in in any form, you know? Um, So, yeah, I mean, and I I don't know. I just, there's so much art house horror that is still so far from the mainstream. 
Um, and I think even in the pandemic, like art house horror that has had the chance to go mainstream, but has still just been widely ignored by people because it's such a controversial genre, right? Like I think the right. night house, um, which came out last year could have been, you know, a, like a, a high horror sort of, uh, blockbuster like if everyone just kind of decided to stumble into their theaters in uh right. oh gosh like august or whenever that was um mm. but like nobody saw that movie <laughs> which i thought was like right. really really <laughs> excellent so i think to a certain yeah. extent like it's such a maligned genre that it sort of resists that uh categorization um i think yeah i think i would take issue with like the general premise honestly okay uh yeah yeah no i completely agree um yeah things like you know the um the folk horror genre which i just am now diving into because of the i don't know if you saw the documentary last year the uh, woodland darks and days bewitched from last year sorry could you repeat that Oh, the uh, the documentary Woodlands Dark and Daysby, which was about folk horror from last year, and I'm just now sort of getting into that genre. I was just curious if you actually uh, if you caught up with that with that documentary. Oh no, God, I'm so jealous. I am. Uh, it is like so high on my. It's literally like I, I still need to watch worst person in, <laughs> worst person in the world and drive my car, and then like oh, for wow. fun watches, like not watches that I feel like I need to do out of obligation to be a part of the film conversation. <laughs> that is like number one on the yeah. list. Uh, yeah, I'm actually, I'm in like a, a film club, which, uh, was started because I just made a video on TikTok being like, I want to have a film club with, uh, you know, mm. people <laughs> who want to talk about movies. <laughs> and, um, yeah. one of, uh, my friends who's also a part of it actually nominated that for a folk horror week, uh, that we did. Um, mm. and it almost won. And so I like, yeah, they informed me of its existence and I'm like, oh my God, like, <laughs> Not, thank you. Um, yeah, it's so so at the top of my list. Tell me everything. What did you learn? What are some of your favorite folk horror movies you've seen? So yeah, I've seen Witchfinder General from like the early seventies, oh. and it's yeah, it's it's such a um, kind of a throwback to that time of just um, and, uh, I forget the guy, the actor's name in it, but he was so like um, reserved and you know just so quiet <laughs> versus what he, what he usually is. But it's, mm -hmm. it is that thing that you were talking about where the, you know, the elevated horror genre isn't getting the respect it deserves, but, in, and it definitely should be, but also, you know, have, you have these folk, um, folk horror uh, movies that I, you could put, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre in there, but there are also, you know, the, the quieter ones like The Witch or mm -hmm. even Midsommar and Ari Aster's films could be put in there. So it is, they, they, it's such a great comprehensive deep dive into the last, you know, even 80 years because they go all the way back to the silent film era of like stuff like Hexen or Hexen, however you say it, um, and things like that. And, um, yeah, just v extremely comprehensive, really gets into even like Native American horror mm. and, you know, things like that and Southern Gothic horror and just so, so many different genres. I could, you know, just dive into each one and, and have something to watch for the next <laughs> two years. But, um, yeah, it was really, really well made, really, um, comprehensive. Like I said, I've seen, you know, stuff like Haga, Haga I don't know if, um, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but I saw that recently. Just so many different, um, you know, things from different filmmakers, from different um, countries. That's what I'm really interested in now in. And that's why I um, enjoy your kind of so much is because it sort of allows me to dive in and explore and find other genres and other filmmakers and other, you know, storytellers that I wouldn't. Yeah. Find. I mean, that's, that's really nice to hear. I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, scratching the surface in so many ways. And it's so cool to meet people who, you know, are more plugged into other niches. Like, you know, I've written for seventh row, which is a fabulous, like independent publication based out of Canada. And, um, my friend, Alex Heaney, who's the editor over there, um, we were comparing like Sundance 2022 notes and she was telling me what she thought of like every single title in the world cinema section, which <laughs> I had seen, you know, yeah. like two yeah. of, um, Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> There's just so much out there. And I think that's such a blessing, honestly. I, my, like, one of my favorite things is when someone comes into my TikTok comments and asks me if I've seen something and I have just genuine, genuinely never heard of it. <laughs> like, because right, I'm like, right. <laughs> well, that's a cool opportunity. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah, no, totally. Yeah, there's I one mean, I would highly 
I would highly recommend um, The Killing of Two Lovers. It's got everything we've been talking yes. about. It's got dread. It's got family dynamics. It's got... Uh, have you seen it? No, um, but it, it was also on my award season radar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's got everything we're talking about. Family drama. It's got, you know, building of dread. Very interesting, um, you know, soundtrack. The the score is incredible. Really, I think... and. Let me ask you about this, too, because I, I've been watching so many re- movies recently with sort of uh, unknown actors or uh, unprofessional actors. I just watched Red Rocket, mm. which is whatever that is. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so many movies now I'm watching with unprofessional actors and people that are just unknown. And I wonder if you agree with this, which is, you know, I'm watching Nightmare Alley and I, and I switch back to something else that has people that that are unknown and just um, that I haven't heard of. And I just feel like it's so the 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 smaller actors and the smaller directors and the smaller writers just are something there's something more organic and authentic about the performances and their writings and i'm curious if if you agree at all with that yeah i think that's really fascinating like it's it's honestly hard for me to start thinking about this and not just take you immediately into like a super like a much larger conversation about like the fact <laughs> that we like the way that we as humans are living right now sort of demands a constant recalibration of what we think of as performance and what we think of as, um, like, uh, oh gosh, relatability or like realness or, or, or genuineness, right? Like, and obviously being in this, on this podcast with you right now, because you found me through TikTok, like, I think about that on a very personal level a lot of the time. Like, people, uh, have opinions of me, <laughs> like based on things that I have just said to my phone. Um, and I, I don't know anything about them, but like times 125,000, um, which is like mm. a very surreal yeah, yeah. experience. Um, and yeah, I mean, like on a craft level, on like an artistic level in cinema, like, I tend to gravitate more towards independent filmmaking. I tend to gravitate towards smaller films. I think that like literally the constraints of independent filmmaking demand a higher quality product in the way that studio filmmaking does not always. Um, because you literally only have so many chances to get it right. And usually it's like one and a half chances, right? Like, you're shooting for a couple of weeks instead of a couple of months. You're shooting in some house in Flatbush instead of like seven different European countries. Um, that, you know, because you need a Iceland to look like, to look like Mars and like Sweden to look like the Death Star or whatever. Um, and I feel like when the resources are pared down. It, it just, it, it just demands a lot more attention and care in ways that, that larger filmmaking doesn't necessarily. But I do also genuinely wonder, like, you know, how have we as a society come to conceive of performance in these particular ways? Because, you know, it's like, do I actually think that, uh, like, Chrissy Teigen is acting just like me on her Instagram story? Like, no, but I also have a certain conception that she is just another human being with a phone. (laughs) So so it's like, I think there's also all kinds of conversations to be had about like celebrity and social media and, and all of these things along with that. Right. Yeah. No, it's really well said. Um, so as we start to wrap up here, I was curious, you, you said, mentioned recently that you were starting to, uh, you know, get the opportunity to write longer articles. And I was just curious how, how that is, how that is going. Oh my gosh. Thank you for asking. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I recently started a freelancing relationship with the rap where my word count is like a thousand max. Um, which that's, you know, it's so, uh, nerdy. I don't know that anyone will generally know what that means, but it is like, anywhere between four, like two to four times as much as I'm used to writing or or two to four times as much space as I'm used to having to express my thoughts. And, um, you know, like for the times I once wrote a like 350 word piece, I think, um, Mm -hmm. about a collection of, I think 
eight short films. <laughs> and so it's like, I, I've gotten, I've gotten kind of pithiness down to a bit of a science. Um, so I love a run on sentence. I love, um, hmm. like, I, I don't know if you've ever read the work of Donna Tart, but some people like, hate no. her for just using endless hyph hyphens and turning sentences into paragraphs. And I'm just like, I can't fault her because I that's me. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, like, I think my main worry is that I'll just like overindulge my my less uh, <laughs> like my more esoteric writing habits. Um, right. But I had my first review in that format uh, this last week for a delightful little rom com with uh, Jenny Slate and Charlie Day called I Want You Back. Um, oh, and yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think, I, I think I, I struck an okay balance. Um, I'm really interested to see how it goes with the next review I'm coming up with, which I'll file on Tuesday, um, about this upcoming, uh, Hulu thriller called No Exit. Um, because oh. there's the, the plot is just like super twisty and, and interesting and, um, yeah, I'm not really, I'm honestly not really sure what I want to say yet, but it's like, I can say, you know, maybe two or three things, whereas it, with my like 250 <laughs> word reviews, I, I'm pretty yeah. much saying like one thing. Um, so yeah. it's, it's like, I'm blessed with options, but also burdened by them, I think a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so last couple questions. Um, what is the uh, best thing you've seen recently that you can talk about? Oh my god. Um I I honestly it's so early to say but I think this movie Resurrection that I saw at Sundance uh which mm, yes. <laughs> you and yes, I were yes, talking yes. about um yes. it might make it onto my top 10 of 2022. It's just so up my alley. It's insane. I mean, I'll watch anything with Rebecca Hall and if you throw Tim Roth in there it's like done deal, but um it's it's just like bizarre and traumatizing and excellent in, in all these ways that appeal to me specifically. <laughs> I love a movie that's polarizing yeah. and I think people are either going to be like, what the hell was that? Or they're going to be like, <laughs> amazing. I love art. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> I, I just can't wait to see how it goes. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I can't wait for that. Yeah, uh, Re 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 Rebecca Hall is such a interesting actress. Um, I don't know if you saw, like somebody did a, a video essay on her character in Iron Man three, how it got completely, uh, written out of the script. Mm. Of that movie. No. Yeah. 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 She had a much bigger part in that movie. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, you, you go on her IMDb and it's like the town prestige and then Christine and then <laughs> everything else she's been doing recently, the night house and tales from the loop. And then just Godzilla versus yeah. Kong. She's like, where, <laughs> where does that even come from? <laughs> it's, it's really insane. But yeah, I really, really enjoyed, um, her direction in passing was incredible. I mentioned this on the podcast a couple weeks ago, but it is such a, you know, light touch, such a, um, lets scenes breathe. She lets the scene, she lets, she doesn't have a lot of cuts, so she lets the scene just play out as it would. I, I really enjoyed that movie. Oh my gosh, same. And I don't understand <laughs> what Netflix was thinking by not promoting it at all. Um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, go see Passing, listeners. Um, it's yes. on your TV right now. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, I had a similar experience with Maggie Gyllenhaal and the lost daughter where I watched passing and I was like, Oh, Rebecca Hall is mm. a genius. <laughs> like, you know, I, I think Absolutely. we're so prone to think of, of actors in a certain way and to sort of like downplay the difficulty of that craft in particular ways because of celebrity and the nature of celebrity. But mm. I was like, Oh no, she's like fucking smart. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so yeah this was a blast thank you so much for coming on yeah thank you so much for having me um do you want to plug your tiktok do you want to plug your um writing um you're at the new york times correct uh yeah sure i'm, I'm at the new york times the rap the playlist kind of all over i tend to promote stuff on tiktok at neil's mom that's neil spelled n-e-i-l uh and i'm also at on twitter at lena l wilson l-e-n-a-l Wilson like the basketball and uh, you can find more about me at Lena Wilson dot work online. All right. Great. Thanks again for coming on. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much.
All right. And so that'll do it for Can I Say Something? And I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.